We hear a lot of perspectives on the Mankind Podcast. Inclusion of a guest is not an endorsement of their views, and the opinions expressed here do not always represent the mission or values of the Mankind Project USA. This is Mark Green, and you're listening to the Mankind Podcast. Looks like the rain has gone. G'day and welcome to the Mankind Podcast. I'm your host, Brandon Clift, and today's episode is all about getting you rugged individuals out there that think you can take your problems into your cave and fix them on your own. Yeah, we're going to give you a new way to look at doing your personal work in relation to others. Now, this is episode three in our series on the shadow. And if you haven't heard the previous two episodes with Dr. David Gruder and Michael Bonahan, I recommend you check those out first because in those previous episodes, we dug into the role that shadow plays in our lives and as well as how we developed our shadow from childhood as a survival mechanism. So before diving into shadow and relationships and your relationship with others around you, I think it's important that you check those two episodes out first. Links will be in the show notes. So from this place, you may be feeling a lot closer to your shadow and have a deeper understanding of how it turns up in your life. But you also might be wondering, well, how do I work through this? Well, it seems like throughout history, men have been raised to figure things out on their own, right? They need to walk their path alone so that whenever they arrive to wherever they're going, they can say, I got here through my own hard work, my own determination. But any one of great success will tell you that you can't get anywhere without the support of others. And so when it comes to your personal work, the stuff that you're dealing with, the stuff that you're carrying, especially your shadow, it's highly recommended that you actually have support from those around you, those that you love, those that you've invited into your life, whether they're your friends, whether they're your life partner, you don't have to do this work alone. So to help us dive into shadow and our relationships, we want to bring on a previous guest, Mark Green. Now, Mark is an author. He's the senior editor of The Good Man Project. And really, this man is just a student of the game as it comes to men's work. In my time interviewing experts on men's work, I haven't come across anyone more eloquent and more kind of quick to the point as Mark. And in this episode, I think you're really going to enjoy how we discuss really the necessity of learning to invite those around us into our growth journey. When we feel ashamed or we discover something about ourselves that we're not proud of, of course, we're going to want to hide it. We're going to want to take it into our cave and try and figure it out on our own. However, as you will learn in this episode, that's only going to prolong the problem. And if we can find the words and the tools and the approach to invite our partners, to invite our friends, to invite our family into our growth journey, well, you're going to find that working through all this stuff especially all your shadowy bits, becomes a lot more simple. Uh, Not easier. (laughs) Let's just say not easier, but becomes more simple when you have that support from those around you that care about you, that love you and support you. So all you rugged individuals out there that have been spending the past lifetime trying to figure this stuff out on your own, it's time to drop the weight, drop the burden and learn that there are those around you who are willing to help carry that weight with you. Here's today's episode on Shadow with Mark Green. Enjoy. Mark, welcome back. It's good to be back. Mate, it's, uh, we've gotten so much feedback from our previous episode that we did together. It was so much fun, too much fun, in fact. I'm sorry it's taken so long to uh, have you back on the show, but very excited to dive into a really important element of shadow, right? Which is relationships Mm. for those that we have around us. But before we do that, for those that haven't heard our previous episode or heard about yourself, take a moment to introduce yourself. Okay. Well, I'm an MKP brother. Um, I came to MKP rather late in life, but it it was a life-changing experience for me. Uh, Prior to that, for a number of years, I had been writing and researching uh, masculinity, the, the conversation about who we are and how we got to be uh, where we are in the world as men. And uh, 
it's actually quite interesting that I did a lot of work on that, wrote a lot about it, had a fairly significant impact. And, and at the same time was like, uh, MKP weekend. Nah, I don't, I don't think I'm ready to actually do any research, you know, on the internal. And so it, it's a beautiful thing to sort of come to understand masculinity, both from a, from a research and from uh, public health issues and all the other frames that you can use. Um, I've written a number of books about it. But uh, but to also then enter into that work in a personal way is uh, really, really filled it all out in, in surprising ways for me. So that's who I am. I'm, I'm a guy who writes and talks about masculinity. Well, Matt, I tell you what, having been in this uh, this space only a little while, relatively short amount of time, I've learned very quickly that those who make videos and talk about and write about masculinity, manhood, who don't actually embody it, who aren't actually a part of the work in the trenches, slugging along, doing their work, they're the worst <laughs> to have to mm. deal with when you're in the space because mm. there's, there's no congruency there. Right. I think men's work is the single most important thing that I can advocate for men to do. I don't think there's anything. I think being in the room with other men who want to create and understand what real connection is about that is ground zero for how we uh, heal the world. Everything else is, um, you know, simply making the case for for getting in the room. Mm. Well, mate, here we are. The math works out. Two dudes willing to go deep and talk about man stuff. So, mm. mate, today we're talking relationships, and we've talked a lot in the past two uh, episodes as we're diving into shadow around the kind of self journey. Right? We develop shadow in childhood to, in, in essence, survive right mm. get the needs met that we weren't getting met as kids and we drag that stuff into adulthood and now many listeners i can imagine or anyone involved in the kind of early stages of shadow work might be wondering well cool like i'm diving into this work personally but i am not only dad or husband or boyfriend i'm also lawyer doctor insert profession insert responsibility and many men have shared with me that it can be challenging to do personal work when you've also got to challenge uh you know juggle a relationship parenthood so many other facets that can get in the way so first start off and just kind of explain to us why it's so important to understand that these journeys can't be done solo that they really right. are best done in relationship with others well what's important to understand is that we build uh and I mean, you know this, any man who's grown up in the world we, we live in knows that when we get to the point where we're a husband or a boyfriend or, you know, a carpenter or whatever it is we are, we have arrived at that, I'm going to use the word performance of that role based on all the rules that we were taught about how to be a man. And I, you know, my experience was if you're going to be a man, don't show your emotions, don't be uh, soft, don't, you know, be tough, be a leader, always be confident, all that stuff. So when we get to being a husband or being any of those things, we're holding that set of rules in our head as we do that. So when you talk about doing men's work, which is about, you know, dealing with shadow, connecting more with who we are authentically and, and God help us going back and connecting up with that little boy who may be pretty seriously traumatized. That runs counter to everything that we're trying to do in our performance of our adult selves. So it's a scary thing. I mean, I, I don't know if it is for you, but it, 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 it's been that way for me. Well, yeah, well, it has been absolutely terrifying. Uh, getting into this work because a lot of my understanding of what it meant to be successful as a man was the outward expression of success. Look at me, look what I've done, look what I have, look what I've achieved. However, mm -hmm. shadow work is kind of interesting. Shadow work looks at all the things that you've achieved and has and just like, like all the papers in your hands, just slaps them on the floor <laughs> mm. and just says, yeah, cool, that's cute. But are you ready to actually do some real work? in life right. and right. It, it is jarring because it is counterintuitive to what i judge society to be societally expected of men yeah like and you, you just said. described you just described a list of things like how to be a man is this list of things that i've done those papers in your hand right mm. um, these are all status markers look what i i have more than you have mm. i've done better than you 
And when we talk about a culture of masculinity, that's really about comparing ourselves, you know, am I enough of this and this and this and this? Have I got enough girlfriends? Have I got enough? Am I able to drink the other guys under the table? Do I make more money? Do I have more power? That, that can be our mission until we're old and gray. If, if we don't think otherwise, and that's all about doing, it's not about being, it's not about who we are. And when I began my men's work, I, you know, I didn't take on all these markers of success because I thought they were valid markers. I took them on because I knew the guys around me would chew me up if I didn't, didn't value those. Right. If I didn't, cause that's the culture. The culture is, is sort of competitive. Right. Mm. And if you don't compete, <laughs> you're not you're not, you're considered to be not even remotely in the game of how we go about being a man yeah so why don't we why don't we kind of start from where some of our listeners might be at in their shadow work journey of just kind of those beginning phases mm-hmm. you know david in uh, my episode with him mentioned that in order to address the shadowy parts of ourselves we have to explore and identify them so let's just say you, me, those listening have just identified that there is a part of us hmm. that has been been with us since we were little kids, right? A story, mm-hmm. a belief that we picked up from a young age about ourselves that's been pulling the strings. And so, of course, we want to work on that. We want to identify how it keeps sabotaging the success that we want or the things that we want to achieve. Hmm. But perhaps the environment we're in and perhaps those that we have in that environment, whether it be work colleagues, family, I mean, even it could be your life partner. We're just unsure of how to juggle both that self-work and that relationship at the same time. When you say juggle, what you're really saying, at least in my experience of the work was, you're asking these people who you have formed an agreement with about who you are, to say, yeah, forget that agreement. I'm actually someone else. <laughs> and in that moment, they, often people are very uncomfortable with that because they've, mm-hmm. all, they've also formed their agreement with you. And it's based on each of the agreements. You know, this agreement is, is, is between two people. And when you say my half of the agreement's going out the window because I'm actually different than that, you, you've broken an arrangement with them, which even though it might not be that great for them, they're used to it right? They're used to that agreement. Yeah. Right. Case in point, uh, I've seen on many, uh, men's weekends and men's retreats that I've been a part of where I've known women say, I'm not even going to stop the car. Like the car goes by, it doesn't even stop. And the man gets pushed out with all of their things and they say, don't bring him back till he's fixed. Right. Wow. (laughs) And then the man, let's say goes in to this new warrior training or men's retreat, touches that piece of his shadow comes away with gifts and a better understanding of who he is and gets an idea, a glimpse, a taste of the man he wants to become. Mm -hmm. Everything that she or he said is what they want in this man. And so they go home and they try and apply that to their lives. And what do you know? She doesn't like it. Mm. (laughs) She's like, well, he has no balls. He never steps up in life. And so he goes to the weekend. Ooh, what do you know? He finally feels his balls for the first time in a long time. So what does he do when he goes back? He starts to live from that place. And what do you know? Uh Uh-uh, it's too much. (laughs) There's an old story um, that used to come up all the time uh, from men that I spoke with. And they they would get told by the women in their lives, you know, you're just closed off. I can't, I don't know what's going on for you. I wish you would be more expressive. And through their work or through some process, therapy or self-help books or an MKP weekend, whatever it was, they would begin to express more emotionally. And what they would find out is that women want us to express emotionally, but not too much. Like there's a, there's, you can show me that you're feeling affectionate. You can show me that you're feeling, uh, you know, a really strong sense of, um, of emotion, but don't show me fear Mm -hmm. and don't show me grief and don't show me loss. And don't show me how much pain you have about your childhood because that shit is big. And I don't want to see that because I still need you to be this person who I can rely on to, um, to be predictable in that way. But, but I would say that the only way to get to a real sense of personal empowerment 
is to push through that stuff. And your partner has to be there with it too. I mean, just like we have to be there for theirs, right? It's very challenging though to, to say, hmm, am I going to, am I going to make this leap across this, this chasm? Because once I make that leap, I may lose that relationship. That person may, may reject me. Yeah. I mean, especially if the way the man has operated up until that point, and we're talking, this could be the first year of dating. This could be first two weeks. This could be 40 years, however long into a marriage, right? Yes. That they go, well, I met her or him while being this way. If that changes, does that mean that I will lose them? Mm Mm-hmm. And from what I'm learning and experiencing both in relationship and being around those doing this work that are in relationship Mm -hmm. is that if you found someone that may not be wanting, but if they're willing to move with you through this process and, and that you have the ability to communicate and go, look, I don't know what this growth path really looks like. I can only check in with what's present in me right now, Mm -hmm. but uh, are you willing to go through this with me? Because I want to be a better man for me. And these shadows are just cutting my hamstrings every time I try and sprint off the blocks and and, and move towards anything. That conversation, I I can imagine, Mark, that conversation, I mean, I I struggle with the words sometimes to to communicate this need. I'd like to suggest a different frame, which is uh, wholeness, right? Completeness. Because I would suggest to you that 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 child, whatever that child had to do to survive, typically means hiding parts of himself, shutting down parts of himself, leaning more into aggression, whatever that might be, is only part of who we are. The person that we're becoming, I don't believe we just dispose of the person we were, right? Right. That man who may have been more emotionally stoic, more focused on success, more more leaning into that performance of toughness, all of those capacities can be brought along. We're talking about adding the set of human capacities, maybe for empathy or, or caregiving or connection across difference or expression to those existing capacities. My, my belief is that most men are only operating on about half of their capacities because the other capacities, which are thought of as girly or weak or emotional or whatever, got shut down when we were very little uh, because of the culture we live in. So maybe it's really not about I'm becoming a different person. Maybe it's I'm becoming a more whole person. And I don't know about you, but once I began, I mean, my, just so you know, the my weekend, I literally ran headlong into my shit. I mean, because I was ready to do the work when I went in the door. Uh, but boy, what what I realized once I started that process was mine was victimhood. I, I really, really was blaming a lot of other people starting from a very early age. And I think justifiably so as a six or seven year old. Why the fuck are people doing this the way they're doing it? But that narrative stayed with me far too long in my life. But that thing where we run headlong into our own shit is an invitation to move past it. And and that's the moment when the monster is staring us in the face and we're like, nope, going back to what I was doing because I'm not ready for this. Or that's when our partner says, "Mm, uh, no, we can't, not this, you know? So it is challenging, but it is like the... It is like the moment in a man's life when he actually, if we push through, I have found so much connection and so much meaning and so much confidence. It's not false confidence of performing it the right way. It's the real confidence of connection with other men and other women and other people and my child, my own son, yeah. everyone in my life. I still carry some of those echoes of of pain and, and disconnection and confusion but God, I feel so whole sometimes in relationship with others that, that it carries me through, you know? Yeah, well said. Well said, Mark. I think one of the challenges and one of the narratives that I've heard getting gets in the way of men kind of, you know, I don't want to use the word take the leap because for, for many men, it isn't a leap per se. It is just they need, it's a first step, mm-hmm. right? But one of the stories or the narratives that's getting in the way of that first step is, mm. you know, 
be prepared to do things, not just do things differently, but be prepared for the entire world, dare say the universe, to look completely different from what it ever has. Because your lens and your frame of reference of the world is going to change mm-hmm. once you change. Which means you're going to start asking not just these questions of yourself, but you're going to start asking these questions of your relationships, of your career trajectory. Of It really does shake a lot of things up once we realize that this mode of operation that we've been working under for however many decades, let's just say, that it's going to change or that it requires that it does change. <laughs> Man, this sounds like a shit show, doesn't it? Sounds like a lot of a lot of struggle and difficulty. But I pain. I'd like to bring some some beautiful news, some really good news to this conversation because ultimately, I, you know, the big question for me always was, well, you know, if I start doing this thing where I'm authentically me and where and well, you know what authentically me, what a big piece of that was for me. And when I say authentic, let me just speak. That word gets thrown around a lot. Let me tell you what it means for me. It means all the things I hid about who I was that I thought wouldn't fit in the culture of masculinity that we're in. Um, I just said, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and do that stuff because for me, hiding it has made me feel like half a human being. So by that, I mean a tendency to, to be overly emotional, to express emotionally about a lot of stuff. That was one thing for me. Another was, um, a real and honest need for, for, for friendship. I wanted intimate connection and friendship with people. And I hid that for half a century because, and and felt all the time, like what's, what is going on that people don't connect with me? What's going on that my best friends, we don't talk on the phone, but once every two years, why do I feel so alone? And why are marriages failing? I, I burned two marriages to the ground, a bunch of stuff. And for me, the answer was, dude, you're hiding half of who you are. Some you've hidden it so long, you don't even remember what it, what, what it is anymore, right? And th- But those voices would come to me in the night and say, this is an empty life you're living. You're just doing the performance of what it means to be a man, but you're, you're alone and you're lonely. And the beauty of doing that, suddenly I feel love for, for the men in my life. I feel love for, for my partner. I feel love for my son in ways that that I think are a reflection of that I'm bringing more of who I am. And I would offer that to any man who's starting this work is to know that when you start doing that, when I started performing that with my friends, I thought, Oh God, they're going to call me out on this shit right away. Cause I'm being more, I'm, I just, they can see it in my eyes. I love you guys. I've known you all my life and it changed them. They actually shifted in that moment. And that was like, holy crap, this is a superpower, Be, just being myself. And, and the shadow, of course, tries to stop us from doing that. It tries in every possible way to, to keep us relying on those old power dynamic methods or those old models of who we were or the strategies our five-year-old came up with. And brother, it, it's only half a life. Mm. Yeah. Isn't it interesting that that by doing this work for me, by doing my work for me, the knock-on effect that has had for my friends, mm. my family, that as selfish as this journey seems, and of course, first and foremost, I have to do this for me. No, I can't do it for any other motive other than for me, first and foremost. But the knock-on effect to my friends, in a sense, by my doing my work, I've just opened the door for them and modeled a different way. Mm. Not the way, just a different way than the traditional way of sorting through one's own personal Mm. shit. (laughs) A bit more of your way. Yeah. You know, they say, we say this all the time, um, that getting men in the room for men's work is very difficult. But once you get them in the room, They'll talk, they'll share, they'll start to connect. It's the same thing in a circle of friends. If one man starts to seem different, other men will be like, hmm. And they'll say a little more. 
and they'll because they're not they're not afraid of getting laughed at or or policed or bullied out of it or accused of being a sissy or whatever the stupid policing mechanisms are that we've all grown up in. Yeah. I I just I I think that I think that human connection is so powerful that it shifts the people around us. What do you mean by policing? I mean that we talk about in my work, we talk about something that Paul Kivel created a long time ago, conceptualized. It's called the act like a man box. And it's these rules for how to be a real man. Don't, let's say don't show your emotions would be mm. a primary rule of the man box. Be yep. tough all the time. Never show fear. Never show uncertainty. Control women and girls. Be heterosexual, not homosexual. I mean, this man box stuff is just your the, the most weaponized version of traditional masculinity and there's nothing wrong with traditional masculinity per se but this is a distorted shadow version of it if you will and once everybody buys into that idea if you break the rules of the man box the first thing that happens is the men closest to you say what are you what are you a girl what are you a sissy come on man man up don't don't be we don't want to see all that so we're all caught in this cycle of policing each other, making sure everybody stays within the performance as it's as considered appropriate. And that is the thing that causes us to hide significant parts of who we are that don't fit that because we get micro police starting in infancy by all the little little boys around us in, in kindergarten, all that stuff. Everybody's already doing it. Right. Yeah. So it becomes this process by which we hide um we hide significant portions of who we are. I mean, for me, it can be a little, I mean, I hid little stuff, a little bit. I mean, you want to talk about policing. Let me just give you an example. We all knew you, you, this may be your experience too, but you do not walk down the hall of middle school with your book held up high against your chest, you hang it down by your hip. And if you raise it just up to your chest and walk down the hallway, you're going to take shit all the way down that hallway, get punched in the arm. What are you, a sissy? What are you, you know? I mean, a tiny little detail like that, we police yeah. so carefully among each other as boys mm -hmm. that you can only imagine how carefully we police the larger issues of how we perform masculinity. Yeah. We live with it. It's the air we breathe and the water we swim in. It's so consistent that we don't even notice it's there. We just think, oh, this is my identity and I have some shadow shit and I have some stuff I never share with anyone because that's what it means to be a man. Yeah. So it sounds like through this process, I mean, I can tell you right now that once I found men's work and got involved into it, it's not like those that policing, it didn't stop for me immediately mm -mm. as both the it's victim and the perpetrator. Yeah. You know, oh, yeah. I mean, it took a long time for, you know, me to stop saying, what, don't be a pussy, you know, don't, you know, just these like, don't be a sissy, like, like, come on, man up. Like it, it didn't mean that those Dude, I'm doing it right enough. now. <laughs> I'm still doing it. I'm, yeah. I'm going to do it until the day I die because it's such a powerful influence, but I can also challenge it, you know? And that's, I think therein lies the challenge as far as it pertains to relationships is if I'm going to do my personal work. It's an invitation for my partner. It's an invitation for my friends that if they want to do the same, that I can support them in that as mm -hmm. well as ask for that support. But nothing can shatter that support quicker than to take advantage during that stuff to be like, man up, don't be a pussy, don't be overly dramatic, right? So by me going into the work of mm. working on myself and having my girlfriend and having my best friend bear witness to this work. They need to know that I'm going to commit <laughs> to not go for those cheap shots, those cheap jabs, those, it, it becomes, mm. I don't want to say fragile, but it, it definitely becomes, you know, in it being a new way, it's like the foundation hasn't set yet. So, and let's, sense. you know what, these conversations always seem to, seem to drift into this place where we're talking about vulnerability or fragility or any of that stuff. I would suggest to you that vulnerability and fragility 
is the man performing the rules that aren't authentic to who he really is. That's, that's fragile. And that fragility shows up in brittleness, in an inability to handle the bigger challenges that crash into our lives, in the inability to handle a real emergency where the only thing we can think to do is to get angry and reactive and start trying to control the whole situation and all that stuff that we normally associate with the performance of power and strength, which is making other people do what we say, having the ability to dominate others successfully, all that stuff. So I want to be really clear that that strength to me is pushing through the fear of this work. Strength to me is having the courage to express who I am really, who I really am. And once you push through, that strength becomes inherent in us in, in my life, my experience of it has been when someone speaks, I no longer run a tape in my head saying, well, what do I think of that? Well, I don't know what I think about that. What does the world think of that? Well, let me see. I think uh, you shouldn't do that. You know, instead, when people speak, the answer comes flows from me very quickly. And sometimes it's no more than a question. Tell me more about that. My wife said something to me years ago when I first met her. And I told you I burned down a couple of marriages and I did. And I had just just ended one uh, prior to prior to meeting her and I said there's so much going on it's just I I wish I had a sense of where things are going and what she said to me was you should learn to love the questions because the answers aren't coming right now and if we as men could learn to love not knowing instead of needing to know all the time could, could be less inclined to say, oh, I heard what you said. I know exactly where you're coming from. I know who you are. I know what your deal is. But instead could say, I don't know. Tell me more. What's going on with you? And, and if we could learn to live with our own um, anxiety to need to resolve things, just let go of that. This journey about dealing with uh, our shadow is in part just stop resisting it as a separate thing and instead just move into it and 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 be curious about what's going on with all of that be curious about the world be curious about the stories that people have about you be curious about the fears that your own partner carries live with this idea that we are that that things are emerging in this work and we are finding ourselves in it, right? Instead of trying to control outcomes and trying to make sure that nothing goes wrong, because that's all part of this idea that, that, that we as men um, have to have certainty. And we don't. What we have to have is compassion and connection and people who love us and people who we love. That's what we have to have. Yeah. It's that... Uh that kind of moving away from that rugged individual <laughs> kind of individualism is nothing but a, but an excuse to, um, to hide. Yeah. I'm hiding from my community. I'm hiding from the other men and women in my life. I'm not making myself vulnerable. I E I'm not sharing those parts of myself that are authentic. Mm. And, and when I share the parts of myself that are authentic, some people self-selected out of my life. They were like, oh, I'm, I don't want that. That's not right for me. And I'd be like, okay, bye. Come again anytime. I'll be here being this version of myself that, that's different than the one you used to know. Hmm. But other people self-selected in. And those people, I love them dearly. And, and it made my life actually, and I don't know how to say this any other way, it made it worth living. Prior to that, and I'm not talking about being suicidal, but prior to that, prior to that, it just felt like work all the time, just work to daily work, trying to find moments when I could self-medicate with alcohol or sex or, or some other distraction. Right. But the, but the me that I was trying to self-medicate myself away from that, that fellow, I, I told you earlier, he had a, had a victimhood thing. And I, I ran headlong into that in my work, my MKP work. When I, came back from the weekend, I, I, I realized, oh my God, I've been telling this story that the world's um, an aggressive, violent, problematic place. And that's been my excuse to tell people, no, I, I can't, I haven't got the energy right now. I haven't got, I can't handle what you're asking of me. I can't do what you want. My accountability as a man was hidden behind this, this sense that I'm a victim and that I'm, that I'm too damaged and too weak and too messed up 
to be held accountable to what other people are asking of me, including my own wife, including my own son. And that's where the relationship issues arose for me. What I ultimately had to do was say, okay, that little five-year-old, six-year-old, his story about a divorce and about a violent older brother, all that stuff. Yeah, sure. There's some victimhood shit in there, but I'm not, but I'm using this victimhood now as a weapon to control other people. I'm using it as a way to get my way. And I would just, I, I describe it as taking a hostage. I would just say, I'm sorry, man, I'm just tapped out today and I, I can't address this concern you have about something I did. And if that person backed off, I'd be like, okay, well, maybe, maybe we'll talk about another time. If they came on a little bit further, I would say, no, you don't understand. I, I'm really struggling with this. I, I don't think I can do this today. And if they came on a little further and said, you know what? You're always using that excuse of me. I, I think you need to address this. Then I would say, you know what? Um, I'm a shitty person. Uh, victim. I'm not. I'm not very good at being a person or a man and I'm real fucking sorry. And that's the moment when I would take the hostage and the hostage was me. And I would start beating the hostage bloody until that person backed off. And that ended marriages. It ended friendships. It ended my, and and it gave me such a sense of self-loathing, a cycle of self-loathing because, and what I discovered, Oh, I'm not the victim anymore. I'm the abuser. And that was the truth. And that broke my fucking heart in the sweat, in the sweat lodge at, at the end of my weekend, I finally arrived at an understanding of that because it had always felt like a stone, a big, heavy stone sitting in my gut. And in the sweat lodge, I sat there and I meditated on this and much emotion led to this and much self-reflection. And in the moment that I was sitting in the sweat lodge and they had the heated stones in there and they were pouring the herbal water on it, I sat there and I thought, I see it. I finally see it. And in that moment, there was a loud pop and the stone broke in half right before me, red hot stone snapped in half. And I said, there it is. It's in two pieces now. Hmm. For the first time in my life, I, I can begin to deal with, I can begin to address this. And it was a powerful, powerful moment in my own work. I said, damn, you know, who's accountable? I, I have to be accountable. I have to be accountable. I can no longer be an abuser in this way. Hmm. Well, Mark, that's a, a beautiful reminder of how shadow can both turn up as, you know, cause and effect versus projection, right? If, hmm. uh, you know, if my challenge is abandonment, someone abandoned me, I can either be the one that's always abandoned or I'm going to abandon you before you abandon me, mm -hmm. right? The two sides of the coin of shadow that in a sense almost makes me feel like, well, damned if I do, damned if I don't, I'm going to cop it from both sides. I guess this is just who I am, stuck here in this. And well, the truth is that's not the case. You're not stuck in that place that you have to create that self-accountability to do something about it. But it's also nice to have those around you that you're in a relationship with to witness the journey, support in that journey. Yep. I'm curious, after your new warrior training, what was the conversation you had with your wife? After you finished with I, the sweat lodge and made, you know, packed your bags and head home. Yeah, you're asking me to remember something that may have been just a sort of a half dream state for me, you know, sort of in this flow of, of flux of mm. wow, that, that, that followed that, that weekend of work. The other thing is that this is the woman who told me years before, learn to love the questions. So she's a very unusual person. She's a couple and family therapist. She's, she's a, she theorizes a lot about relationships and we had spent years talking. So I was lucky in the sense that I was able to come back and simply admit uh, to what I had discovered. And it was very emotional for me um, to weep out this sense that, I mean, the work I had to do after that was different. One of the things I had to do was I had to grieve 50 years of my life pissed away on this stuff, you know, never getting to the work until 
I was, you know, until half a century had gone by. Mm -hmm. And and I beg any man out there, go go earlier, go sooner, go hard at it, because you'll live a richer life. And and my life now, I'm happy to have my life now. I consider myself blessed. I don't need it to have gone, have happened when I was 20. But I did have to let go of a lot of losses and a lot of things that I'm I'm sorry I never took took more uh, care of. Wow. I can I can feel where you're at and your emotion, Mark. Yeah. Thank thank you. Thank well, you. I appreciate I this is the thing, man. I, I honestly, Brandon, I meet men in this work, including yourself. And I, I feel seen and I feel connected and I feel strong and I feel powerful and I feel like I can love children and women and other men in, in ways that, that make them glad they met me and knew me, that I can support them and care about them and see them. And so the echoes from, from my, the changes I have made into the lives of the people I care about are huge. But the men I have met in this work, above all other things, are the, are the powerful blessing in my life. I went to that work. I stood on the carpet and I said the following. I don't, I don't like men. I don't trust men. I hate men. And I'm sick to death of being alone. And that was my victimhood voice. And that was my it, relationship with men in this culture of dominance, bullying culture, for, for all the years of my childhood. And I was cheating myself out of connection. Now I, I love men. I meet men and I just, <laughs> I'm like, damn, look at you. Everything you have done in your life. I'm not just talking about men in the work. I'm talking about any men I meet. I think, look at you. Look at what you've carried and done and made in this world. And look at the way you're, you're, you're fighting. You're fighting every day to be. God bless you, man. Let's, you know. Let's just, if we could just learn to love ourselves and, and the people in our lives and be more completely who we are. Mm -hmm. That's my invitation to any man out there, man. Just just go at the work and go at it hard. Well, mate, I, uh, I think that might just be the note that we wrap things up on. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you for going there. It's, it's all great having theoretical conversations on this and that, but to actually go there and embody it and feel it i'm feeling it right now me too that's that's the richness that i felt like i missed out on for 25 years before i found this stuff yeah like it is it's bloody awesome and i really want to speak to the listener right now as a man that's on the journey i haven't arrived to whatever it is <laughs> that mm. a black belt and shadow work looks like if there even is one <laughs> <laughs> i'm like a yellow belt just trying to figure it out but what's alive in me and what i feel called to share and i'm sure i've said this so many times so i apologize to the uh, the beaten horse this stuff is not linear it's messy and it's only going to be messy, but damn, it's rewarding. Yeah. So rewarding to touch these places and go there and come out alive. It's like every movie, every hero you've ever loved to follow, you are so much more invested in their story once you saw what they had overcome. And just like what you would do to your physical body, whether going to a weightlifting gym or a karate gym or whatever you would do to try and build yourself up physically, this work, I would argue, will make you far stronger, but also far softer and more capable of being able to stand on your own two feet, look in the mirror and go, yeah, dude, I see you and I fucking love what I see. Yeah. And life just becomes dope. <laughs> it does. It does. <laughs> Mark, any, uh, any final words, anything on your heart that you want to share before we wrap up? I liked, um, I liked your comment that it's not linear. And, and I can tell you, it, it's, we, somebody was, was saying the other day, why the hell do we call it men's work? Why don't we call it men's joy or, or men's play or men's, but I, I will tell you this. I, um, 
I have not been so happy in the presence of other men since I was a young boy. And I remember the joy I had in friendships as a young boy. Just, I am going to go out and create freaking gold for a full afternoon with my friend, George Turney, because I love him. You know, I'm six years old and I just love this guy. I've begun to find that again now. And I, I think that's the, that's the echo of an empty house that a lot of men struggle with, right? Where, mm. where are my friends? Where Every room is empty. What is wrong here? So I, I invite you to find us and become, be, you know, men are waiting to do this work with all of us. But not only that, it's not work. <laughs> it's joy. It's friendship. It's connection. And there is no version of being a man that is wrong. You want to be tough as hell and keep your emotions to yourself? No problem. Just don't cheat yourself out of being who you fully are. And we're good. We're good. Yeah. Every version of masculinity is beautiful in its own way. There is no, no one way to do it. My way, by God, it's not your way. Hmm. But join us because the one thing that we find ultimately is that we like all kinds of human beings and we like all kinds of ways of expressing. They're all beautiful. So thank you, gentlemen. Um, I appreciate getting a chance to tell my story to all to all listeners, to everybody who's out there. If you want to find me, I'm at remakingmanhood.com. Hmm. And mate, why don't we take this opportunity to talk about the Healthy Masculinity Podcast? Yeah, we, we have a podcast called Remaking Manhood, the Healthy Masculinity Podcast. We talk about theory. We talk about personal experience. We talk to a lot of different folks who are just trying, men and women alike, who are just trying to build a, a, a culture of healthy masculinity, a healthy masculine culture of connection. That's what we're into. So come find us if you'd like. We're on anchor.fm. Yeah. Well, Mark, as always, mate, been a pleasure and uh, can't wait to share the mic with you sometime in the very near future, mate. Absolutely, Brandon. Good luck, brother. Thanks, brother. This has been the Mankind Podcast produced in association with the Mankind Project USA. I have been your host, Brandon Clift, and I personally want to thank our guests for joining us today and imparting their wisdom from their experiences in this amazing journey called life. And of course, I want to thank you, the listener, because through your attention and your support, you make it a heck of a lot easier for us to let men out there in the world know that they are not alone and that there is more than one way to be a man. Special thanks, of course, goes to my incredible team, Marketing and Communications Director Boyson Hodgson, Producer and Editor of this episode, Michael Russo, who makes me sound so much more intelligent than I actually am, so of course, special kudos goes there. And if you've been enjoying the music throughout this episode and all of our episodes, check out Jim, Donovan, and the Sun King Warriors. I have links to them in the show notes. Now, the fee for this episode is simple. If you found gold and insights that you believe could benefit your loved ones and those you care about, be sure to share it with them. And of course, remember that life doesn't happen to us. It happens for us. So long as we rip the pen out of fate's hand and become the author of our own story. So my friend, pick up the pen and we'll see you next week. Lots of love.